first hearing of the economics of music streaming. We are joined by Guy Garvey, singer and songwriter for the band Elbow and BBC Six Music presenter, Ed O'Brien, guitarist, Radiohead, and Nadine Shah, singer, songwriter and musician. It's still morning, sorry to keep you waiting, but good morning everyone and thank you for joining us. Morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we received an email into the committee, uh, I think it was yesterday, from an artist. I'm going to read you the email and then I just want to sort of gauge your sort of ideas in terms of whether or not this is a regular experience. It was from uh, Aluna Francis. It says, Sid signing with Island Records in 2012. We have generated over 1 billion streams but only saw a royalty check for the first time in 2019, that's seven years later. Even then we had to pay that money to the label because they said we still owed them from the touring. My label took a large percentage of everything and owned the masters. Instead of being able to invest the profits in further touring, writing songs or merchandise, we had to give it to the label. Expenditure on projects was in no way discussed, even if we asked. But all the income from streaming was going towards recouping some unknown vast sum of money that essentially meant you, you won't see a dime for a very long time. The lack of transparency with what you were actually earning from streaming and how your label has spent money can leave you completely in the dark, working for years without seeing any money. Is this, is this, does this experience chime with you? Uh, Nadine? There's so many of this, of, of this that does. And I think one thing to be said is that whether or not it may or may not surprise you of the, the little the artists know about the logistics or the intricacies of the nature of these deals. I mean, I, I for one, I, listening to the last, um, the last, the speakers previously at this in the last session, I feel embarrassed almost to admit the little that I do know. But this is an industry which, a lot of this industry is based on trust managers giving contracts to artists with there's no there's, sorry managers um beginning relationships with artists with no contracts and there is this idea of well trust us you concentrate on your work you do what you do and leave that nitty-gritty to us don't worry your pretty little head essentially um and and to an extent yes we do want to focus on the work that we're making and that does require a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of our headspace. But most, but a lot of this does baffle us, but a lot of it is alien to us, sadly. So I, I, I can relate entirely to what you were saying there, yes. Hi, Garvey. I'd say that uh, uh, Nadine is absolutely right. You sort of, you don't get into music with a view to studying its economics. Um, and managers make themselves available to you. And that's that's the first kind of minefield you approach as an artist. Um, Elbow are very lucky to meet the manager we still have in Phil Chadwick. Um, but a lot of the time people don't. And a lot, of the, a lot of the time people are let down. And I would say that the, uh, the situation that that outfit um, find themselves in, I, I think situations are as wide and as varied as the number of contracts out there. I think you get lucky and you get unlucky. But the bias is, as we've been discussing all morning, um, the general bias is to um, ultimately not be able to pay your way as a musician is where we find ourselves. That, that's, I think, where we, what we've come to discuss. Actually, then, I'll bring Ed in in a second as well. Um, but we heard in the first session that we're sort of, sort of standard industry contracts. Is that not the case? Guy? I'm sorry, repeat the question, I'm sorry. In the first session, we were told by our witnesses that there were sort of standard industry con contracts out there. So what you just said there sort of suggests that actually some people get lucky and some people don't. Um, is that really the case? Is it, is it, is the, 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 the example I just used there, is that an exception? Have they just got a bad contract? And actually, just by having a good manager, they would have got a better contract. Is that is that a fair estimation? Yes, I'd, I'd say I'd say that's the case. I, I think you can you can steer uh, you can steer it better if you have somebody who knows what they're doing, 
Um, it's not true that great art finds its audience. Uh, this is the reason I got involved with these proceedings. Um, I have been new music, be it some time ago when Elbow first started putting records out. Uh, and we were lucky enough to meet record labels. Obviously, I, I mentioned film and manager. We were lucky enough to work with labels that developed us and got us from bedrooms and garages to a Mercury nomination on our first album. Um, uh, the reason that I've come here today, and I think uh, I can speak for Ed and Nadine here as well, is <clears throat> the system as it is, is threatening the future of music. And, and that sounds very dramatic, but if musicians can't afford to pay the rent, if they can't afford to live, then we, we haven't got tomorrow's music in place. I'm here because of what I've, I've been looking to live as a musician for 20 years. Um, and, and, uh, and that required the record companies that, that nurtured us and developed us and the producers that we went in and the cathedrals of recording studios we used. And all this assistance and nurturing came from record labels, from management, from publishers. Uh, and I want what we had for the next generation of musicians, but it's become so skewed. I mean, streaming in itself, actually, streaming is a bit of a miracle. Uh, I was listening uh, to Betty Smith this morning because I was awake at 5 a.m. because I've been really nervous about appearing here. Uh, and I realised that I was listening to the re a recording that she made for me 100 years ago. Now, the fact that you have access to every recording ever made, every piece of music ever recorded in your back pocket for £10 a month uh, is a miracle. Almost. It's almost a miracle. If musicians are equitably paid, then it's a miracle because then it's sustainable and then it's something for everybody to be proud of. The guilty feeling that came up in the last panel about, can I really get these artists for this little money whenever I want? I have that guilty feeling, but I don't think it's peculiar to people in the music industry. I think anybody who weighs up the effort and the time that goes into making their art and into making these recordings, and not just the art, the craft and the skills of producers and recording engineers and microphone manufacturers, you know, all, all, the, all the different technical staff that surround this industry. Uh, you take all that work into account. No, you shouldn't really have it in your pocket for £10 a month. And if you have got it in your pocket for £10 a month, some of that music better be going to the people who put it in your pocket in the first place. It's really as simple as that. The record labels are business organisations, and businessmen are not very good businessmen if they freely give away their profit margins. So they need a little assistance here. But I think as, as, we, as we enter 100 years, 100 years of, of popular music being recorded for, for us to hear, I think it's something that's really achievable from here. Tom said in the last session, Tom Gray said in the last session, this isn't because of COVID. No, it isn't. But now it's really, really desperate. And as Nadine said in her statement, musicians are having to look at the books. They're having to look at the system they're, and they're having to say, we need some help here. Let's not let it get as far as lawyers facing each other down. Let's get our heads together around a table and work out how the British music industry can keep being something to be proud of. Let's set a standard for the rest of the world in the way we remunerate our musicians. And, um, and I best stop talking for a bit. Divorce this morning uh, from a popular beat combo, I believe. Um, <laughs> uh, Ed, uh, could, you, could you add to that? Have you, you know, you, you heard that sort of email that we, we, we received. And then we hear... You know, a uh, guy just sort of say, saying about how he has, you know, made 20 years living out of music. Do you fear for the, the generation to come and, and the sort of pipeline of talent if the economics as they stand right now just stay in place or even get worse? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the essence of what we've got is we've got the system that I call, the, the era that I was signed with Radiohead, we were signed in 91, and I call that the analog era. And we've got this analog model that had huge, huge imbalances, unfairness, and you're all being, you know, it's interesting to see your reaction to the testimony this morning. You're becoming aware of the unfairness and the, 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 the opaqueness within the business, and then you're bolting on this digital model, and it's not working, and it's not working. And, and you know, I'm an exception to the rule because, you know, 
I actually feel quite embarrassed being here because I'm a six, I, I, I've been able to do this for, for nearly 30 years or whatever. But it's the young artists. And yesterday, I was actually, Guy, Nadine and I got together because we were nervous. <laughs> and we wanted to, you know, just get familiar. And Nadine said something really, really, really striking to me that sort of echoed the last 24 hours. And, and so Nadine's not going to, I'm going to, Nadine's an extraordinary artist who gets played a lot. She's a really important artist. If you listen to Six Music, she's one of the pillars of Six Music like I do. And she, and so she's a successful artist. She's not like on a Radiohead level or whatever, but she's really doing amazing work. And she said, yesterday she said, I struggle to, to financially support myself. And that's, that's crazy. I mean, there've always been imbalances in the system and they need to be addressed, but it's more acute now. Alex Davis-Jones. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for coming forward this morning. Um, we've heard a lot about um, some of the negative aspects, aspects of the streaming services and the platforms, but what is your opinion on um, those streaming services as a whole? Do you think they've had a positive or negative impact on the whole of the music industry? Ed, yeah, come on in. Yeah, I think they've had a really positive impact on the industry. When I started getting involved with artist rights and sticking my head above the parapet, which was about 12, 13 years ago. And we founded this organization called the Featured Artists Coalition back then. And it was about providing a voice for the artists. And the thing that the biggest issue that we were dealing with then was illegal file sharing. It was off the, off the scale. So for instance, you know, kids were going to college and they weren't, um, they didn't have CDs, they were past CDs. They were illegal fire, file sharing through Napster, through Limeway. You could get the entire catalogs for free. And the whole argument with the industry, as Colin said the previous thing, the, the revenues went right down. And the whole argument was like, how do we deal with this? And people, some people start thought, well, we should, we should illegally prosecute file sharers. I always thought that was absolutely nonsense because if I was an 18 year old, and I had the chance to download everything for free. Of course I'd do that. I love music. Of course I'm gonna do that. So what's been brilliant about streaming is that it's shifted, it's the, the norm of behavior has shifted. And I think, you know, Spotify tends to get a, a bad rap amongst musicians and stuff because overall they tend to pay less. But I think there's a reason for that because of you know the way that they they fund it, the way that way that it's paid. It's they have this freemium level, and I think that's really I believe that's a really important thing because you introduce, you know, you introduce streaming in that way, and it takes people away from file sharing, and so I think and, and in terms of the last five years, we can see it within the industry. There's you know during the, the end of the noughties and the beginning of this decade, it was down in the doldrums. But now there's more optimism. There's more. There's more. Definitely more money coming into it. Greater budgets do greater creative endeavors. It just needs some parity and fairness in the system. And artists, as you're kind of gathering, are not are not really profiting, or many artists from the spoils of this. Well, Guy, I'll bring you in now, but that actually brings me on to my next question. So you mentioned that artists aren't um, getting a fair, equitable treatment in this, but do you think the other parties involved are? So the streaming platforms themselves, the record companies, the publishers, are they taking a fair proportion of the revenue? Are they, uh, are they taking a fair proportion? No, yeah. that, that's why we're here. Uh, it's No, I don't think they are. I think it, it's, um, as I say, business organisations are supposed to be good at business and this is why there needs to be some kind of an intervention uh, it has to be recognized that music isn't such a great job that you can do it on nothing you know it's like everybody does it on nothing in the first place and then when you finally get over the you know the look sideways that you get from your friends and your family when you tell them that you want to be a musician you finally get over that and you you get some recognition <clears throat> Back home, that still wasn't an income for quite some time. I think for the first three years that Elbow were, were signed to a major record label, we were still on £300 a month, something like that, and we couldn't believe it. Um, the reason I've got involved is because it's got harder since then. 
what streaming represents, what it could be, if we do this right, is a niche musician who might only have an audience of 40,000 worldwide can earn a living from that, not just earn a living from it, but have enough money to go into a studio for six months to explore and deepen and further their art and make better music. Uh, and, and then their audience grows because the music is better, um, which is which is not the way that some music is made. Streaming is benefiting from an awful lot of music. It has to be said, where I'm sat now in, in the dairy in Brixton, most of the other musicians that come through the door um, look at me agog when I say that Elbow spent two years over an album um, because they're in for a day. They've written it in their bedroom. Mm. They come in and do vocals and then it's mixed remotely and, and they put them out as, as and when they write them. And for pop music and grime and for hip hop, it's a totally brilliant model and it and completely works for them. But that shouldn't be the only kind of music in consideration here. Uh, the, the lovely thing that could happen is that everybody finds their audience and, and that it's as wide and broad and beautiful as music is, it's supported as such. And, and it gives people, I mean, uh, Nadine has got first hand experience of this. Her contemporaries are people who have dropped by the wayside on account of the way that economics is shifting. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and then how much transparency, transparency is there when it comes to deals between sort of recording labels, publishers, collecting societies and streaming services? Do, do you guys get to see that as artists yourselves or do you feel it's quite transparent? Okay, no, I, I don't feel that it is that transparent. I don't. Um, the things that I do know, I can be asked many questions about the intricacies of, you know, what I earn and how many streams and this and this and this. All I do know is that the earnings from my streaming, they're not significant enough to keep the wolf away from the door. That's... <laughs> I'm in a position as like as, a, with, as an artist with a substantial profile, a substantial fan base, and it is critically acclaimed, but I don't make enough money from streaming. I'm in a position now where I'm struggling to pay my rent, and I'm embarrassed to talk about these issues publicly. I'm embarrassed to talk about them for many reasons because money, you know, it, it's sometimes to an extent is an indication of success. But here, that's not really the case with me because I am a successful musician, but I'm just not being paid fairly for the work that I make. Transparency, like I said, when I, like I first said in this session, <clears throat> often we are encouraged artists, we are encouraged not to ask these questions here and that I don't think there is enough transparency, no. But the bottom line for me is that what is transparent is that I'm not being paid. And this is the same for my fellow musicians. And so many other musicians all over the world are in the same position as me, where they are struggling. They are struggling. We can't, we can't afford to be musicians. And that's a wild concept, eh? To not being able to afford to be a musician. So then we're in this, this really stark, bitter, awful reality where there is, the reality is that we could lose lots of musicians, lots of great music. And like was said in the earlier session, what Tom was saying, this country is known yeah. for producing some of the finest musicians of all time. And we best protect them and make sure that continues. Yeah, it would be absolutely devastating. Guy, yeah, you wanted to come in. I'd argue we've already lost an awful lot of music. Um, I mean, um, we, we can't put this down to what we're talking about today. The piracy that Ed was talking to and referencing uh, there's no two ways about it. Streaming has saved us from piracy, um, but it's not paying in such a way that that's making a difference to musicians starting out. Um, it, it, and the niche, niche musicians as well that Nadine's talking about, you've got to remind yourself that some of the oldest and the biggest names weren't pop stars when they appeared. You know, I don't have to list them. Um, you used to have a look at anything over 20 years old in your, in your, in your music collection. In terms of transparency, um, and I'm referring to notes that I've got from a manager, uh, so I'm swatting up here, Nadine. I'm not claiming <laughs> to have this knowledge. Um, but he says that, um, that Polydor accounts was every six months, they show 
clear and accurate income streams. We have a great relationship with our record label. I feel I should say that. Um, and also he says that Spotify and Apple have management apps which show real-time streaming figures and historical data which can be referenced with the label info. So he's happy with uh, with that element of the of, of uh, right. Of okay. Space. And and so you're happy with your your record label and your manager, but do you feel like you're um, represented fairly when it comes to these negotiations directly with the streaming services? And and if not, what would you recommend in order to make to make that case? Or to, how how would you overcome that challenge? <clears throat> I think this needs to come from all parties. I think when I saw what Tom was doing online, which is the reason broken record is the reason that I came forward. My, my perspective and the reason I thought I could be of any use at all to the committee in making their recommendations is because not only am I a, a musician and have been paid as such for 20 years, but I've been a, a music broadcaster for 14 years with the BBC. So I'm constantly supplied with new music, albeit in the area of the garden that Ed and Nadine and I represent within alternative indie music, if you like. Uh, and I've seen artists come through, often, um, you know, connect with their audience, uh, become end of year chart favourites, or like Nadine, Mercury nominated artists. You were robbed, by the way. And, and then I've seen them disappear. And the thing that happens when a musician stops producing music, when an artist stops making art, is there's no fanfare or press release you just hear one of their songs three or four years down the line, you think, oh God, what happened to them? And, and, and so, so much of the new music that I play, I don't hear album two, I don't hear album three, and I know why it's happening. The other thing is, is the embarrassment of going home to the same people who looked at you sideways when you said you wanted to be a musician, the embarrassment of going back and admitting that financially you're failing, that, that's why there's only us three here today. Ed and I are in a, an advantageous position because we've connected with our audience. We've, we've found the people who afford us a living as musicians. Nadine is incredibly brave because she's one of the few people who's been, thwart, uh, one of the few people here that's been thwarted by all this and her contemporaries are being thwarted by all of this. So I think as a result of these panels, what I hope happens is that an awful lot more musicians are, are honest with, about their incomes. I, I think However leaky the boat has got, young musicians still don't want to rock it. And they don't want to admit that they, they can't make ends meet. I mean, particular, particularly in genres where how much money you've got is part of your lyrics. Nobody wants to admit that they haven't got any. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, fi fi good. That, that point actually will bring me on to my final question, because like you said, you guy and Ed, you've, you've been lucky, you've been fortunate, you've been able to connect with your fans and, and, and to make a career financially out of music. Um, with coronavirus and fans not being able to, to come to gigs and, and artists not being able to tour and connect with their fans as easily as they would have been, what impact do you think this is having as well on, on the future talent of the industry? And then the impact of fans and, and if there are changes to streaming services, how will this impact fans as well? I th it's, it's obviously going to have a huge impact and we don't quite know the fallout, but I also, it's, you know, the whole thing with the, with COVID and it, it's not just, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually not just Radiohead, I'm a solo artist as well that was going to tour this year. So I'm starting again mm. and I, have there's a band there's five of us I'm I, I pay four musicians and there's a crew of four or five and their livelihoods are gone overnight and my band my musicians don't have an income they can't tour and that's and they're also session musicians so they don't have so they're you know my 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 bass player my friend is doing he's he said well I'm gonna have to take a year out and this is a chance to do an MA or something um, the crew, the crew people, the pe my crew people, most of them, and these are not these are not roadies in exclamation. These are technicians. These yeah. are proper technicians and engineers, and most of them, in fact, most of them I know have become have become delivery drivers, Amazon yeah. drivers, because they've and, been excluded as well from the support packages, haven't they? They're part well, of the freelance community. Yeah, totally. And there's a massive, you know, uh, you know, we. we their family as well, musicians, yeah. crew, we're all family. You know, we have so many experiences together. So 
it's it's obviously huge. The answer to your question, it's massive. And I don't don't quite know the impact that it'll have on musicians. But of course, young musicians are who re, who rely on uh, live income are going to really struggle. And it's interesting because, you know, as Tom Gray said, this is we shouldn't be having this because live income has fallen away. But for so long, yeah. live income has been like the band aid. Yeah. It's just like you know. And I just want to add that thing is. The inherent problem that we have as musicians is we so love doing what we do. So we kind of, I mean, I've done this a great rehearsal, great recording. You go, I'm the luckiest bugger on the planet. I would do this for free. And that's precisely what has been that's taken wrong. advantage of over the years, <laughs> starting with 40, 50, 60 years ago. And because the thing is when you, it's one thing listening to music, but when you play it and make it, it's like, you know, it's like therapy. I, I had years of depression and I kept my head above the water because I'm in this band with my brothers. And it just made me feel that every time I checked into rehearsal, you know, so that's kind of, you know, I've slightly digressed obviously, yeah. but there, there has to be an understanding of like why, where we started and why we've been taken advantage of is because <clears throat> we absolutely adore what we do. I think it's very, sorry, I think it's very important to dispel that myth, which I hear being bandied about, uh, bandied about so, so often, how lucky you are, how lucky you are to be a musician, because it's a very enjoyable process and all the, all the benefits that you reap because of it, it, we work hard, we work very, very hard, and we do provide a service to so, so many people, especially in this time as well, if we're, yeah. going, if we're going to relate back to the pandemic, I believe that music has been vitally important to so many people to connect us together. And we deserve to be paid fairly for what we make and we work hard. It's not all parties and fun and all the rest of it. God, don't I know I was born too late to not experience any of that. <laughs> but it's not the case. We have to be able to a pay our rent <laughs> these are the things we have to we have to be paid fairly in order to make work yeah guy i'll bring you in quickly and then i'll finish i think pretty much covered there what, what i was going to say towards the end we're not after robert plant's third limousine you know there was a period there when musicians were paid way too much you know what we're talking about here is allowing people to live as working artists to provide something that we all need you know music's not just something that soundtracks bits bits of your day it's an important social doc document like the rest of our it, it either reflects or reacts or provides escape from where we are in history and time and it documents what we are as a as a species yeah. in in something other than construction or destruction it's uh, yeah. too important to not fund it is. It's a necessity. It's fuel for your soul. You know, just as much as water and air are, I would, I would argue anyway, for me personally, music is f definitely food for your soul. But thank you, Chair, no more for me. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Julie Elliott. Thank you, Chair. It's fascinating listening here. It's, I think what's coming out of this is that what you're talking about is the principle of having a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Um, and that really should apply to musicians as much as it should apply to uh, a dentist, a, a shop worker or whoever. Um, and clearly what we're hearing is that isn't happening. Um, and what I'd like to draw on um, is, and it's been alluded to from you all so far, is that Nadine, you've come through and broken through as a musician in a different era to Guy and Ed. And I'm not being ageist here because I'm older than all of you. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like you to tell me a little about bit about your experience um, breaking through in the in the era of digital and streaming and I'd like to also know about something I asked in the previous panel about what advice and whether legal or other you were given when you were signing contracts when you were just starting to break through could you sort of give us a brief picture of your journey please in regards to streaming in, in breaking through in the age of digital and streaming, rather than, and, and I'm going to ask Ed and Guy this after you, when they broke through, when things were different. Yeah, well, mine was still in the time where I would look to artists like Ed and Guy, and that was the model that I knew. 
-hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm thrust into this new way of working, which is in complete, which is not in relation to the, the ways that I saw the, the model yeah. work for Ed and for Guy. It was very, very different. And all of a sudden there's this digital era, which was just, I mean, this is my fourth album I just released in June. So it's, you know, 10 years a professional musician. And don't, I'm only just at the, there are people who do um, what I do much better, who are much more acclimatized and better at working at um, social media. For, for one, I, I hate using social media. It affects my mental health. I'm, I don't want to document what I'm eating all the time. <laughs> I don't really like, um, there are so much of us as musicians that we have to now, there was a beauty in a time. There was a beauty of mystery. Mm -hmm. which shrouded a lot of musicians and you could be mysterious whereas now that's not the case and there is so much of us not only the work that we put into the music that we make but there is so much else that we have to put into this every bit of our being here's what I'm eating today here's this and there's a constant mm -hmm. interaction so I would say the work doesn't end from making the music um, and then releasing it it then continues every day. We become these entrepreneurs of sorts and that's not what I signed up for. But when... And did you get advice or support when you were starting to get record deals or whatever? Did you have any input into what was happening to you as an artist? I always had a legal representative present, always, always. And I had a thirst for knowledge because I had a bad experience years and years and years ago with a big manager, years and years and years ago uh, to do with the singing competition. And so I wanted to, um, I wanted to read up and I wanted to provide myself with the tools um, to enable myself to have a bit of protection on my own. But I did have legal representation with me every time I've signed a contract, every single time. And most musicians do. I hope that that's a case for all musicians. But the landscape is changing all the time. The landscape is constantly changing and it's not working. So, I mean, it, it's very um, brave of you to talk about the fact that somebody as successful as you is not financially really earning enough to, to provide the basics. Um, that's clearly wrong. Um, and what do you think um, could should change what would make the difference to you as an artist to be able to make a, a reasonable living for what you do okay so a, a meaningful a meaningful yes. income is what I ask for yeah I don't want to throw anybody under a bus either and you know so what Tom Gray was saying earlier on about equitable remuneration equated equal pay for equal work right yeah and then and then a meaningful income from streaming and I, I i truly believe that it's entirely possible to fix streaming and to make it work for everyone the labels the streaming platforms and the artists it just needs leveling out i think so yeah it, definitely definitely it needs to be made it has to be fairer because i think right now presently it, it's wrong. Yeah. Ultimately, it is wrong and it is unfair. Thank you. And Guy and Ed, can you tell me a little bit about your experience coming through? What was different and what what you think perhaps has changed to the negative for people starting out now? I mean, you're both a, a position where, you know, you're successful. You've 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 got a good life out of being musicians. And that's that's where Nadine should be able to get to and others should be able to get to. Can you tell me a little bit about both about your experience and what you think needs to change to put this right? It's it's interesting because it, what we so we signed in 1991 and we signed what was a very traditional deal at the time um, that put us essentially on about a 12 percent royalty. And, and were once, you given advice on that? Were you, yeah, you I mean, we, listen, we did our homework. We really did our homework because we realised that a lot of bands kind of, we saw bands from Oxford that did, weren't making it because they didn't, they didn't have the right setup. So the first thing, it was like, get, get the best legal advice. So we'd got the best legal advice. It was a guy called John Kennedy at the time. And um, 
but there were certain parameters that, so for instance, when we were signing, we signed a six album deal with EMI at the time. And uh, the thing that always grated, that was always hard to accept was that we were signing over the copyright for life, that the record company, they give you that, you know, they, as part of the deal of promoting you and investing in you and marketing you, they earn. So, but there was nowhere, there was no room for maneuver. You heard the odd, you heard the odd example of a band or an artist who was being, you know, there was a bidding war going on and they were able to negotiate that. I think the Rolling Stones, Andrew Lou Golden back in the sixties managed to get them a licensing deal with Decca at the beginning, which was highly unusual, but you know, ours is a very standard contract. And it, it was, it was all the things that you heard in the first session about tour support and there was a big investment. Um, and we were obviously very lucky because we had, a, we had a song on the first album that was a worldwide hit, the only worldwide hit that we had. So it kept us sort of on parity. The money that was invested in us came back through uh, the sales of the first album. Um, so again, I'm not a great example, but what was, I think what I saw in a lot of bands as well at the same time, you know, it was hard on a lot of bands and there are a lot of artists now and maybe, you know, the same kind of legacy artists who didn't have the success of Radiohead, who are on those same royalties, i.e. they're still on, equates to a sort of a 12% royalty or whatever from an, a pre-digital era. And they're still, their contracts now in the digital era and when they're being streamed, mm. they're still getting that same royalty rate, their royalty rate hasn't gone up. So they're not seeing anything. They might have unrecouped. So, you know, it's, it's so back to your question. How is it for younger artists? I think it's, I think it's always been tough for artists. I just think it's even more murky now with the lack of transparency, the opaqueness in the system, the fact that some parties are making, you know, some partners are making huge amounts of money, some of the labels and stuff like that. Um, it's, 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 I think it's always been tough, but it feels like it's tougher now. There's mm. less money, you know, artists are really, really on the breadline. Mm. And Guy, thank you. And Guy, your experience and, and particularly your experience, you've said, you know, you know, as a, uh, somebody who works, uh, for, in radio, um, where you just see artists disappear as well. Do you, do you ever get any feedback or knowledge on what's, what's actually making them disappear? <clears throat> it, it's difficult to talk about without naming artists because the circumstances are so specific. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, anybody who's not come forward uh, is, is not comfortable with coming forward. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that will change. I just want to stress that again. I hope that we can, throughout these proceedings, uh, hear more evidence from a more varied uh, group of artists. But um, um, my experience is with the band, we've been a band for 30 years. Nothing happened with us for the first seven of those years. Arguably, we were unlistenably bad initially, getting less bad as time went on. But then around the time it started sounding good, there was interest. The interest grew. And then we were signed to Island Records. We made our first album in a studio with the remarkable Steve Osborne. We'd never seen a studio, let alone <clears throat> worked in one. We learned so much in there through his wealth of skill, because one of the casualties of the whole of this whole system is how little producers are valued. Um, in fact, uh, Ed's long-standing collaborator, Nigel Godrich. Uh, equated it to we don't know how they made the doors of Notre Dame Cathedral we've lost the skills because it can't be written in a manual and it's the same with the generations of, of rock producer coming from accurately miking things up to being an integral part of the sound like with the Beach Boys and the Beatles and then eventually with Radiohead it's in, and, and th that those kind of skills are going by the wayside because without investment uh, without an income there's no investment because you're not expected to make anything. And without investment, how can you afford to go and, and let your art grow in a studio environment? Anyway, um, in terms of my experience, I got with Elbow to, to work in that way. We were dropped before the first record came out. Uh, so 
and then we were scooped up by V2, who were an independent label. We remade the album, we remade the first album, and it was nominated for Mercury. And that sent us on a very slow ascent, which we were very, very happy with. And then in 2008, we had our international hit. <laughs> uh, and that put us on a, a different level. Um, and as I say, we've been incredibly lucky because Ireland, despite not having released a record with them, the, the experience we got, and we got to work with Steve, and then through V2 and working with, with Ben, who, who co-writes and produces Nadine. Uh, and then uh, after V2, uh, we signed to Fiction with Polydor and, and we're with Polydor now, Fiction with Universal and now with Polydor Universal. Everybody we've ever worked with remains a friend because we had an amazing creative nurturing experience. And it's because there was a budget there and there was room to breathe and grow and I remember our agent, Jeff Kraft, saying very confidently on our first meeting, when we were making the first album, nothing significant is going to happen with you up till your fourth album. And he, and he was disturbingly right. It's not what we wanted to hear then. Uh, but it's that sort of long, forward-thinking, nurturing, that's disappearing. And it's disappearing because of the instant nature of streaming. And it doesn't have to be that way. Streaming... What, what do you think can be changed? What do you think that we can recommend to change to make that change? Well, I think <clears throat> that the user-centric streaming model uh, for, for the new music that I'm talking about that, that needs a, a hand just to keep living, just to pay the mm. rent. Uh, so I don't want to call it niche, it grows over time. Mm. Uh, the, the stuff of, of value rather than um, I mean, not, not that there's no value in, 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 in instantaneous likable music, of course it's valuable, but there are different kinds of record that you only want to hear once and not a hundred times, you know, a week. Uh, not something to dance to, something that hits with you, resonates with you on a personal level. That music just needs an income. It just needs, if, if there's 80,000 people worldwide, thanks to the internet, which wasn't there when we started out, I was watching this happen and I was thinking, you can connect with your audience without waiting for a guy with a checkbook. You know, you can connect directly through the internet. You can make records in your bedroom. And then slowly as time went on, I thought, I can hear that records been made in a bedroom and I can hear that's had no investment and that's not gonna get nurtured. Something as simple as, you can't hear what you're saying on a record. That's the first thing a producer does is turn that fader up you know, and I hear all this music with such massive potential disappear mm -hmm. because they can't make the rem. Uh, so I, to answer your question, I'm so sorry. It's okay. The, the user-centric streaming model, I think ultimately would be very, very valuable. I think there needs to be more transparency as well, as much as possible. And that I think involves ultimately, as with all of this cooperation, but I think the first thing that can be done is, is uh, equitable remuneration, I still can't say it, ER. I, I think right at the top, something that isn't negotiated in any way, that's a right to the people who made the thing that you're listening to. I think that is a viable first step that the committee can recommend. I think that that is something we could do right now, which would have a lasting effect. Uh, so I think as a first step there, as a second step, I would say transparency alongside trying to wrestle into place a way of getting music paid for, not on its popularity, but on how much it means to the person listening to it. If you only listen to Nadine's record, to This Is The Kits album, to Samantha Crane's record, <laughs> if you only listen to them that month, the depth of your appreciation should be, uh, it, it should be correspondent with where your money goes. That's kind of a moral contract that needs sorting out. I'm not sure how many people know that their artists are not getting paid. There's a sense of ownership when you love a band or a song. It, it's, you know, how often do you hear that's our song, you know, mm -hmm. our first dance and, and or, or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like the sense of ownership should come from the fact that you bought it mm -hmm. or that every time you listen to it, you pay for it. It's a bit like I remember when I bought my first record, where which shop I went into, and none of these places exist anymore. But that's called getting old. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. That's been really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. My mine was uh, Baggy Trousers by Madness at Woolworths in uh, 1981. <laughs>
Um, Damien Green. All going to show how old we are. Mine was Roxy Music uh, in the 70s. Uh, absolutely my band. And Which one? The first album was, I can still remember taking it home uh, and playing it. Um, anyway, uh, enough of how old I am. Um, and I want to pick up one of the points Ed made about the, the move from analog to digital, which is which is not just changed the way we listen to music, but also changed the economics uh, of the whole industry. Is it inevitable now that most people are listening to, to music on streaming? Is that going to benefit established artists over new artists in a way that wouldn't have been true in previous ways that new generations would have listened to music? Maybe the established people's chance first, Ed. What, what? Can, sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, does the fact that the, the bulk of music is now being listened to on streaming inevitably mean that established artists are going to be favoured because of playlists and so on over new artists that inevitably definition nobody's heard of yet? Yeah, I mean, this is what this is what I think your the, the previous testimonies are saying as well that the the way that the, well, the way that it's paid out, the streaming services pay out is is uh, benefits the big big artists who get you know millions and millions and millions of streams. So yeah, it does create um, a, a, a sort of a false uh, not false, but it, it creates a, a, a sort of a bias within the system for sure. Um, so yeah, I to I couldn't disagree with that. And does it matter that there are very few of the the British labels left, the sort of traditional uh, labels that haven't been taken over by the majors? Does does that make a difference to the the economics from the artist's point of view? Well, I don't I don't know about that. I think it's interesting. I'm as as a solo artist. I'm signed with Capitol Records in. In America, which is part of Universal Music, as a as a with Radiohead was signed with Beggars Banquet, which is a an independent the the big independent British label. And the thing that's interesting in um, America with Capital is there have been a lot of British people. You know, the the the, the music industry um, ha, the, or the culture. There's a there's a lot of British people at the top of uh, of the major record labels. I mean, it, obviously, you'll know better than me the economics of the fact that whether uh, there isn't an EMI anymore, which is paying, you know, corporation tax in the UK. I don't know about that stuff. And so obviously there's an economic impact. But I think in terms of, um, you know, we're, we're a global society. So, um, you know, it reflects that. It reflects that, that people move, that there are a lot of British, Brits all over the world doing great stuff in the music industry. So I, I, I'm... I mean, obviously, it'd be nice to have a major that's British, but we've got Beggar's Banquet. We've got a lot of great, really thriving independents um, who, 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 who are very British in identity. And, and Nadine, do you, I mean, do you feel that you have a, a sort of nurturing label that's helping you? To an extent, yes, but I think that it's important to keep going back to the fact that there are three major labels who are recording record sky high profits and that musicians aren't seeing a penny of that. Well, maybe a, maybe a few pennies, but aren't seeing, that's not being reflected in what we're being paid. Um, the discussions with my label, I think actually mine is quite a fair term. I think that there are darker powers at play and I don't want to speculate too much about, um, uh, too much in relation between uh, certain artists with certain deals with labels and how Spotify may favour them. But I am now acutely aware of my deal with my digital deal with my label, but only because of this conversation. This is only the past week and a half. And I believe that many, many artists in the same position as me are not aware of those things. That's really interesting. I won't, I won't probe any further because I can sense this is quite sensitive for you if you speculate on the motives of, of some of these very powerful people, which is it's instructive uh, for the uh, committee. Um, maybe Guy, a, a question is, does the, the dominance of streaming now um, influence the way you write music or perform it? Does it actually have a direct effect on, on the artistry? 
your your mute guy. There we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, streaming has uh, streaming has only affected elbow positively so far. I couldn't tell you if you would have made any more money under the old model. I suspect um, what streaming pays compared to the deal we were on for our physical are on for our physical copies sold. I'm pretty sure we, we see less money there, but streaming's allowed us to find different markets in the world that we wouldn't have been aware of otherwise. We went to Mexico in January, which seems so long ago, um, but we went to Mexico in January. We, we wouldn't have known that we had an audience there if it wasn't for streaming. And I have to say again, I think it is a wonderful thing. I think it's, it's, it's close to being the future. Uh, I have to say, uh, where the major labels are concerned, I have to put my hand up for people who I've known and loved within those labels, who I know to be motivated positively, who I know to be motivated to get music out there and to connect music with its listeners in the same way as I'm motivated. Um, I think you get a load of business people together and they start doing business, they'll push it as far as they can before laws tell them to stop. I think that's what happens. Um, I think the consequences, I wonder if this is actually going to be a wake up call for a lot of the sort of amorphous cloud of major labels that we're talking about. I wonder if individuals are aware uh, of, of quite how universal these complaints are from the music community. Um, I, I can't stress enough that I know there to be really, truly good people at record labels right the way to the top whose motivations aren't negative. It's just this has been a land grab, it's been clumsy, it's also subject to all kinds of contracts signed with hundreds of thousands of artists and of course historical things need to be made up and improved. As I've said my interest here is for the music that comes after my generation to make sure we don't lose that art, that's that's my main concern. Um, um, I, also don't, I also don't think um, any of that is out of our reach, complicated and murky. It's been the response I've had to most of the questions to do with why can't we try user-centric for streaming? Why can't we try that model? The reply always comes back, it would be complicated, it might be murky, there may be costs, but, but nothing hard standing in its way really, other than a bunch of businesses that don't have to try it. Uh, and then if you talk about that and you talk about equitable remuneration, again, something else we can do, then you've got a foothold into really transforming this 100 year old thing that we've got now. You know, I keep coming back to that and I've got off your question somewhat, I apologize. Back to you, uh, Julie. Ah, you mentioned earlier on about the importance of producers and uh, I'd include engineers as well in that. Um, I mean, obviously, that's sort of uh, developed uh, the role of the producer, and, and these days, very often, they're very intimately involved in the actual uh, making of the music and sometimes the writing of the music as well in, in, in recorded music. Do you think that if this committee were to uh, recommend that there should be an amendment to the law to make equitable remuneration available to musicians, that that also should include producers and engineers? Because of the nature of their changing role, I think it would automatically because as producers have become co-writers in uh, certainly in pop music, uh, they, they already are entitled to that equitable remuneration because they're shaking tambourines, playing pianos, on drums, doing backing vocals. There are still you know, one but, or two. I was, I was speaking to Cameron Craig, who's won two uh, uh, Grammys, uh, the British bass producer originally from Australia, um, the other day. Um, he's one of these, a bit more of an old fashioned producer in that he doesn't tend to shake the tambourine, uh, but does the, the, the production bit. Even if you were fell into that category, do you think there is a case to be made though anyway that, um, that producers ought to be included in, in this right by definition and also engineers? Certainly producers um, and I would say because they have a creative role, certainly producers. Engineers, I'm not discounting. I, I don't know, I've never pondered that before. I, I couldn't give you a straight answer to that. I think uh, if musicians were paid properly, people would invest in them up front. 
and that would allow money to go to producers as it did and engineers and studios that made, that made these places. And I would say also that the, the production roles you're talking about, the kind of co-writing producers, which is all the people at the studio I'm sat in now, um, it's a very different skill set. It's very fast. Uh, it, it doesn't allow for weeks and weeks of exploration, which is how some of the most famous records, some of the most groundbreaking records, including OK Computer, I know were made. Lots and lots of time experimenting with sound in the studio, not coming up with a chord progression and a hook and then dressing it, but actually going and exploring. And, and, and the idea that that continuing exploration sonically, creatively, has come to an end because this business model doesn't suit it, I, I think is a problem. But yes, certainly producers should be uh, paid for being the uh, creators that they are. Engineers as well, but there we are. Um, can I ask Nadine, um, can you tell us, Nadine, a little bit about the process that, by the way, congratulations on being named number six in BB6 Six Music's uh, Album of the Year um, uh, um, list and uh, for Kitchen Sink, which uh, for the dozens of people watching these sessions, I would recommend that you should buy it in physical form. But if I'm allowed to do that, Chair. But um, can you tell us a bit about the, your, the process of making that album, what you had to put into it, given that we're talking about what you get out of it at the end? What did you have to put into it to make that record? Time. Much, much time. And um, <laughs> it's hard not to sound, to come across as too emotional with these things because I, I do want to hit home so, so much that we need to be paid properly for what we do and not to get too emotional about these things, but there is so much time and care that goes into the making of an album, especially the kind of the work that I make. Um, I write about, particularly on that album, um, I have to be very sensitive to the subjects that I write about. I feel a kind of duty of sorts to write in a responsible manner about the people that I'm writing about on that album in particular, I was discussing subjects about women's infertility, women's fertility, um, feminism, uh, the, per, the policing of women's bodies. These are very, very serious subjects and I didn't, I don't take any of that for granted. And it was very hard myself emotionally to make that album uh, during the time, a very difficult time for myself personally anyway, writing that album. Um, so much goes into it. And it's very hard to kind of say, here's my clock in, here's my clock out, of when I start and when I finish. There is so much that I put into making my work. And one thing that I do know, which is reflected, thank you kindly for mention about um, today with the Six Music album, one of the albums of the year. But the point with that is that it, what I have seen and what I've heard from people their responses is that they, they appreciate this and this means a lot to them. Many women in the same position as me who are struggling with illnesses like I have, like endometriosis, and I speak about that very bluntly, which aren't spoken about in a lot of music, but there are musicians who speak about certain subjects like I do. And I know that this is appreciated and I know that it is needed to be spoken about by certain artists and I worry because some of the artists that we're talking about, and I mean, I don't consider myself to be so niche or so alternative. And I don't consider many of the artists that I love and I listen to to be that niche or alternative, but many of their messages are universal and they are important. And these are the artists that I'm here to represent. And these are the artists that I wish to protect. And these are the artists which aren't currently being paid fairly. Okay. And that was a very time-staking process making that album. And I respect my fellow musicians go through the exact same processes which I do in order to make work for people. Going back to um, streaming, um, recently Spotify introduced something that became known as the tip jar, namely uh, given an opportunity for people streaming music to make a donation to their favourite artists. What's your reaction to that, Nadine? Um, mine, initially I thought this is interesting, oh this is another way of making money. I found it insanely condescending. 
It was an admission of sorts by that platform, which says, we know that you're not making enough. And like I said earlier on, when I have to talk about you know, transparency in my earnings and what I make among my peers and my fans, I don't want to come across like I'm cap in hand. I believe that I am worth and I deserve to be treated better. But I do believe that that was an admission that this system is not working for us. And I found it very, very condescending. Do you do any of the, the new types of ways of connecting with fans like Patreon and things uh, of, of that kind? And is there anything for artists like yourself? Is that is that a route artists should be considering as well as trying to get some more money out of streaming? It is a route that I am considering, but then that said, you know, there are many routes that I can take when I, I don't use a record label. I don't use this or this or this, and I take on so much more of the work myself, but I do believe that that would be detriment to the music that I make because it just takes up so much more of the headspace that I do believe that I need in order to make the work that I do. But financially, a lot of these other options are possibly a lot more viable for me, but I have the luxury of having a dedicated substantial fan base already. There are many artists who are not in my position who do not have a dedicated fan base attached to them already. And those services may not help them so much because they don't have that fan base to now talk to, whereas I do. I could now turn to my fans and say, I'm taking it away from here. And this is where I'm going to put it. And I exist solely with that fan base and we connect that way earlier on that you didn't think streaming had uh, had any detrimental effect on the way that you make music with elbow but in the music that comes across your desk have you noticed this phenomenon of shorter introductions to songs um, and is that something that perhaps actually might be a way in which the technology is actually affecting the, the way that songs are being presented you're on mute guy I'll get used to this um, uh, you've actually reminded me that we have altered the intro to a song uh, for fear that it wouldn't be uh, included on playlists. We had a long introduction uh, to the first song on our last album, which we clipped for streaming use. So, yeah, there is that. But Elbow are an album band. We never had the conversation. We never discussed whether or not we were an album band. Uh, and in those terms... Plenty of bands that are contemporaries of ours, plenty of artists that are contemporaries of ours, uh, don't consider the recording the finished artwork. They, they, they consider the recording some recorded versions of songs and the songs as an entity of the <coughs> album. Um, but certainly for us, uh, the end goal was an album. And because we never discussed it, whenever we have com uh, conversations about what to do in an instance like, will you trim that intro? so that it will be included on a playlist, we'll, we'll say yes if it leads people to the album. And, and that, that might be an old model in some, in some people's eyes, but it's certainly the way I still listen to music. Um, and there are plenty of new album listeners out there. I don't think there's anything wrong with playlists. I don't think there's anything wrong with algorithms. If they lead people to music they wouldn't have otherwise heard, I think they're great. I think curated is, is a lot more interesting, a lot more exciting. And I think, actually, if the streaming platforms did have an open relationship with musicians, they'd find their creative input to be over, to everybody's benefit. I'd rather hear what Ed listened to when he was making his solo album than have it algorithmically delivered to me. Um, and I think other people would as well. But there's all kinds of scope for cooperation here. If, if the basic question of whether or not there's a problem is answered honestly by all parties. I think that's the exciting thing about being a part of today. I think if we can all acknowledge there's a problem, okay, uh, we can start working together. And fi finally, Ed, I've I've had some <clears throat> meetings over the last couple of years with with Imogen Heap uh, about blockchain and that, uh, and its potential as a technology perhaps to solve some of this problem about whether or not artists are able to trace and identify you know, the money that they should be getting for the use of their, their music. Um, is that something Radiohead or you've taken any interest in? And do, do you think that kind of technology might be another way of, of trying to make sure that people get paid? Um, 
I don't know enough about blockchain and sorry, I haven't, I mean, I'm, Imogen has worked tirelessly on it and there were elements of it that really struck me that I love. I mean, we have a problem with data that was outlined. We do need, the, 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 this digital era requires a, a proper global database. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but on, you know, on, on, on a stream, it doesn't say on, on, on who the songwriter was. So if you, you know, there's a real problem here. So, you know, I think uh, what Imogen was trying to do was to address that, but I don't feel confident enough to uh, answer that question properly. Sorry, I mean, I, I'm not sort of up to speed entirely with blockchain. That's, that's fair enough. It's very patchy. You can dig down on, on streaming services and find out who the songwriter is through clicking on the three little dots sometimes, but it's very, very patchy as to whether that, yeah. that data is there and indeed, the, you know, the production data as well, which would need to be there for people to get paid. So uh, I think perhaps that's another area we, we, we might, you know, have to have to say something about in, uh, in relation to data. But back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, John Nicholson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chair. And can I just say that I, I think we've heard some extraordinarily moving testimony uh, today, uh, in, in particular, um, the fact that uh, you, Ed, were prepared to talk about mental health issues um, is very unusual. And as somebody who, you know, actively campaigns on this issue, can I thank you for the fact that you, you did that and, and you too, uh, Nadine. Um, Nadine also, can I start with you? I just think you've been incredibly brave to talk in such personal terms uh, for us. Um, you, you've talked about financial struggles, uh, which I think all of us have found really shocking. Um, but can I reassure you that you said you were worried about coming across as cap in hand. You have certainly not done that. You've just made a very reasonable point that you should be paid fairly for your work. Um, can I ask you some basic question? What would you like us to do on the committee? What would you like us to recommend that would make things easier for people in your position? Uh, thank you for that. And firstly, um, thank you very much for this inquiry. I'm very, very grateful to it, uh, for it. And uh, I'm speaking on behalf of so many of my friends, my fellow musicians, so many of them who were scared to speak out because we don't, myself included, we don't want to lose favour with the streaming platforms and we do not want to lose favour with the major labels. But what... And, what and sorry, and you're worried. Yeah. You're worried that by putting your head above the parapet that you could be punished in some way. You called me brave, some have called me stupid, but I'm used to it. And... Um, uh, but well, I, what, what, sorry, can I just ask you about that? What kind of punishment do your friends fear that could be incurred by doing what you're doing? It's something that I don't want to go into speculate. And it's, you know, like I was saying before, it's maybe a darker territory that I don't want to go into so much. But I think, you know, it, it is just- You don't want to give them ideas. Yeah, all that. Um, but I, you know, it's because we know, because we, I think, but like Guy was saying before as well, I don't want to be in a huge fight with record labels. I don't want to be in a fight with streaming platforms. I also think Spotify is brilliant and I use it and I pay my subscription to Spotify and Spotify enables me as a lover of music, all things weird and wonderful. Spotify enables me to access catalog to some really quite obscure artists. I love um, Iranian psychedelic music. I love music, which is, uh, I love Ethiopian jazz. I love Ghanaian music made in West Africa. There's many music, there's much music that I love that I have access to via this platform. And I'm grateful to this platform for that. But I worry about the artists that I listen to equally. Are they being, are they being treated as unfairly as I believe that I am and my fellow musicians are? What we can do, what you can do, this inquiry is, honestly, I've been feeling pretty hopeless, pretty hopeless. And I know that I speak on behalf of so many of my fellow musicians when I say that, but this actually has made me feel very hopeful. And that's very exciting. And I find this whole inquiry extremely exciting and I'm very grateful. Well, what thank you, thank you, thank you for that. People don't often say that to us. And of course, that's exactly what these inquiries 
are meant to be about. They're meant to, I'm a journalist by profession. And, and what I like about the inquiries is that you can ask experts questions and they can give you answers. And if you don't understand the answers, you can ask other questions and then you can compose a report which you hope will help uh, advance good policy making. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm keen to know from you specifics that you would like us to include in our report, which will help. Thank you, John. Thank you so, so much. And I think I go back to what Tom Gray was saying earlier in the first session and that, you know, I've started to do my homework and equitable remunerations. This seems to be, you know, equal pay for equal work. I do make meaningful income from my PPL, so I don't see why that shouldn't be able to translate to this model as well. And I think that is mainly my line in that I do think that is... I don't believe this will answer all of my questions or solve every problem, but I do believe that this is a step in the right direction. And I believe the knock-on effect of providing this legislation could be phenomenal for so many of us musicians. So I would oh, say... Okay, so we, we talked about the user-centric uh, model. Would that help you? Because, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I was quite surprised to discover that if I sit and listen to an artist that I enjoy, there's not a direct correlation between the music that I'm listening to and what that artist gets. I didn't realize that. And I really want to encourage obscure musicians, young musicians, um, musicians who, who might have been forgotten about for that matter. I want to encourage those. And I don't want my tiny contribution to go to big successful artists who are already rich anyway. So would this user-centric model, if we were to recommend it or to try and help secure it, would that work for you? I hope so. I'm an advocate of it also. I think the fact that anybody who is spending their hard-earned money on anything, they want to know where it goes to. And I think that from talking to my fans, for example, many of my fans get in touch with me and they say, what's the best way for us to listen to your music? Because they want to, and just like that, just like that YouGov um, poll Tom was talking about earlier on, m most fans they they want to know that the well they want to know that the the fact that the, the artists that they love they want to know that they're being treated fairly. They also want to know that they're able to act. They want to know that those artists are going to be able to continue to make music that they love. And I I respect. I think the user um, the user centric payment system is a great model. How realistic that is, because these conversations I've been overhearing about Deezer and all the rest of it, I don't know. But yes, I think it is a brilliant, brilliant model, and I'm all for it personally. Okay, that's very clear. Um, can I move on to the other subject that I raised with the panel, the first panel, um, and that was Brexit and the effect that Brexit will have on artists who tour, uh, the ability for artists to get in and out of the UK easily, and for their fans to get in and out of the UK easily. The first panel were pretty damning about Brexit and Brexit preparations. What's your sense as an artist about where we're placed with the weeks ticking down to the cliff edge? Uh, personally, I find it terrifying. I already have to, um, touring is a very expensive, um, it's very, very expensive for me. Um, I've only recently been able to make a decent profit from touring after many, many years. Um, as a solo artist, I have to pay my session musicians and I choose to pay my session musicians fairly and well. I hope they tell you that. Um, and there's a whole team of us, and like we were saying, it's a family. And it was so beautiful. I remember my first time touring around mainland Europe, and I was in France, and a very good friend of mine from Germany said, oh, I see you play. I'll, I'll be there. And I said, but, it's, but I'm in France, but you're in Germany. He said, oh, you, because there's a bit of water around you. You don't realise that. And that was the beauty of it. And I felt so connected to mainland Europe. It was a really beautiful thing. And it has been my bread and butter for a long time, as it has been for so many other musicians. I, unfortunately, I've not been able to tour the US um, because the visas are far too expensive um, 
for us to undertake doing that for each one of my, the members of my band, for me to pay for that each each visa. It's it's just not um, it's not been possible for us. But Europe has been, and I really worry that because obviously the festivals they pay us they pay us well and they pay us fairly, and um, and that's where you make a big body of your income from that gets you through the the lean months. Yes. The majority of my income comes from my pay, but that has taken a long time. That has taken a really long time. I would say that was album, I'm on album four. I would say it was by album three, I was able to make that kind of profit from touring live that would be of any kind of um... Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let me ask a couple of uh, quickies. Uh, Guy Garv Garvey, um, uh, thank you for your uh, very powerful uh, testimony. I'm sorry you're up at five o'clock in the, in the morning worrying about this. Um, <laughs> we're pussycats, uh, really. And I, I love the idea that you use something like Spotify to listen to older artists. And, you know, it's, it's strange, but the other day I was listening to the ink spots on Spotify because I was talking to my partner about my grandma and what her favorite music was. And I just remembered the ink spots was, was, was a band that she loved. And I found the ink spots uh, on uh, Spotify uh, and I started listening to the ink spots and uh, it rather upsets me that uh, guy that, uh, that the ink spots descendants, because I'm sure we're on to the grandchildren, maybe great grandchildren now, won't get a penny from me listening to the ink spots. So it, it seems that there's a consensus growing that, uh, that when we listen to stream music, it should be user-centric in order to help artists. I believe so, I believe so. And I'm, I'm sure that it's <clears throat> not without its complications uh, in, in, in implementing it, but I just can't see a downside to <clears throat> uh, an artist uh, receiving money that directly reflects the depth of affection the listener has for the music. And, and, and just a little, I suppose, uh, in terms of does user-centric, does the model favour bigger artists? I don't care how successful Drake is. I don't care how much money he makes. <clears throat> Good for him. Uh, and Ed Sheeran worked his balls off to get where he is. Uh, I remember Nadine telling me that she used to see him jumping up on stages all over Camden um, without a microphone playing his trade. And, and it's sort of like, great you guys, go and be successful. Uh, we need the next one. We need the next Ed Sheeran. And, and, and we need to make sure that the platform is broad so all these people come up. I also want to know that people who are making music that only appeals to a thousand people, but touches them to their soul, get it, that's reflected somehow monetarily. Uh, it's something akin to the way that radio popularity is worked out but I don't know quite enough about that. It's not just figures, it's reach or something like that. But um, uh, what was your question? Listen, listen you know, that's loud and clear. I think all of us on the committee have got the, have got the message. Ed, can I finish uh, with you? Again, many thanks for talking about mental health issues uh, in front of the committee. It's, it's hugely important. Can I, uh, however, uh, pursue the line that I was asking Nadine about, and that's the effect of Brexit on the music industry, because for bands that tour, it's enormously important, isn't it, to be able to cross the border back into the UK and out again, really simply and without paperwork. And I, I've certainly been quite shocked by the evidence we've had today from every single witness who tells us that they've had no discussions and no industry discussions have taken place, apparently, with the UK government about this. We seem to be utterly unprepared for what's going to happen on January the 1st, and that's going to have a big effect on bands which rely on this, this summer festival market for a significant bulk of their income which then has a knock-on effect to what people listen to in the winter months. Absolutely. I mean, we're not prepared for it at all. And I think, you know, when I talk to my managers, people are just, they're just waiting. They're going, to, well, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's huge. It's massive. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting hearing Nadine say 
she can't go to she hasn't been to America because the visas are prohibitively expensive. Um, you know, touring America is is is. I mean, I've been lucky because I've done a lot of touring in America, both solo, well, mainly Radiohead, but also solo. And it's it's really hard getting in there. It's especially in the last four years, it's been even harder. Um, and one of the things as a young band with Radiohead was that ease, you know, we basically from 91 through to 98, we didn't stop at all. If we weren't, if we weren't making an album, we were touring. And so much of that touring happens outside of the UK. And it happens in Europe. And it's about building your tribe, building your following, going back there. And it's an essential part. And the summer festivals, in terms of um, not only the way that you grow, you know, you first our first festivals, we were on at like 11 o'clock in the morning and Rage Against the Machine were on. You learn your craft through that as well. It's not just monetarily. There's a, it's an education. It's a rite of passage. And to have easy access to that and to let it flow is so key. It's so important for young artists, middle artists, even bands like Radiohead. I mean, you know, we can, Radiohead is a, a different example because we can probably, you know, get around any problems like that. It's, but because of the kind of sizes of audiences, but it's so key. It's so key to sort this out. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Steve, and finally, Steve Bryan. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a, been a privilege. We could carry on all day, but you've got other things to do and the uh, broadcast team will cut us off. I just, just wonder, Guy, if you um, were aware that the Apple Music streaming service, um, the guy who runs it gave, it, gave an interview a couple of years ago. He said, we're not in it for the money. Uh, they use it as an incentive to encourage users to buy the iPhone and the iPads and then to stay in the Apple family the apple ecosystem so basically you're clickbait and uh i just i just wonder whether that rather sums it up i've heard it before because of how devastatingly insulting it is yeah <laughs> uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it's too easy to to come out with things like that it's too easy for a company like apple to say that they are the point and their product is the point I'd argue that a phone that plays music is popular not because it's a phone, you know? Uh, <laughs> I think that the general attitude needs to be that this is not yeah. content, you know? The, the word content is so offensive. Yeah, I agree. And just, just and it's then on, 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 and it's a brilliant device. They are brilliant devices, and I use yeah, yeah. them, you know, but yes, that's really insulting. On festivals, because it's been mentioned, we're also doing a piece of work on looking at festivals, which I think you will find interesting, because obviously they uh, have taken a huge hit this year. Most of them haven't happened. Um, even the biggest of them all, um, you know, has really struggled. We've got to make a decision very soon as to what's going to happen for next year. Just if this doesn't change, this inquiry and what we're talking about, given that there is almost certainly going to be festivals that mm -hmm. don't return as a result of this pandemic, what what do you think um, that has as the impact on the talent stream, the next, the next round of clickbait for Tim Cook? I think that festivals are as much a foothold to find your audience as radio play, uh, yeah. as, as being included on a playlist, as being recommended, in print, I think, but festivals also, and going towards what Ed was saying there as well, the first time I felt like um, Elbow could consider themselves successful was when Jarvis Cocker nodded at me or when Ian Brown waved at me, you know, or when Bell and Sebastian challenged us to football. And it's, you know, the, the sort of, the privilege of being a, a working part of the music community isn't lost on any of us because we love music in order to get there in the first place. And I have to say, I find this in people who work in the music industry right across the board. I, ha I have to say, this whole conversation, what needs to happen next? We need to come together. I don't think it's a case of, we, we've heard artists banging on about labels before, throwing stones at the giant, you know, and, and demonizing record labels as being this thing. They promote and they, uh, lift up what we do and they get it out there and the streaming platforms are the latest thing in all of our armory to connect with our audiences 
what we're seeing is foul play and we need to put a halt to it and we need to put some things in in place in law that will stop it happening again we want to improve what's already there but when i was listening to bessie smith this morning thank god somebody pressed record and i could hear her voice from 100 years ago you know they're an integral part of, of, of what we do and i also think that the people that are listening to music at the other end need a voice in this as well people are now very responsible about what they eat how they shop for clothes i think they consider themselves responsible and i think they'd like to be able to ethically source their music <laughs> yeah, that's a brilliant way of putting it just just finally guy because you're because you, you're a you're a bbc radio presenter i just wondered if you had any view on the um on the ongoing discussion around the fairy tale of New York. Um, the, 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 the delicate listeners of Radio One will be um, spared the original lyrics. Uh, the rest of the stations will make a choice and Six Music will alternate between the two. I just wondered if you had a view on this latest twist in, in historical one. correction. I, I, I do, a very firm one. That song is a songwriting masterclass what it does in four minutes is beyond comprehension it's so beautiful you won't believe how long the intro is compared to the rest of the song for a star and for something so beautiful to be lost because of a offensive slur i think is crime so i'm, I'm very in favor of the lyric being changed because i want to hear it again and again and i want to do that without any feelings of guilt Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for, for your time, all, all three of you. It's been a real privilege. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank and, you, Steve. And thank, thanks thank to you. Tom Gray. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that will conclude our session. Uh, thank you to Guy Garvey, Ed O'Brien, and Nadine Shah for your evidence today. Order, order. Thank you very much. The proceeding has ended.